Keeping them honest every night. AC 360. CNN. Weeknights 10 Eastern. Tonight at 360 Special Report, the Sissy Boy Experiment Uncovering the Truth. Now, over the next three nights, we're going to show you what happened to a little boy who got enrolled in a government-funded study aimed at making effeminate boys more masculine. He was just five years old at the time, and decades later, the research that was done on this boy is still being cited by those who think kids can be prevented from becoming gay. The story begins in the early 1970s, when the little boy was treated at UCLA's Gender Identity Clinic under a pseudonym. His real name was concealed. His treatment at the time was called a success, and still many people consider it that it was. But now, more than 30 years later, we finally know what really happened to this little boy. His name is Kirk Murphy, and for the first time on television, his family is sharing his story, their story, with us. And they're doing it because they want you to know who Kirk really was. They want you to know what he went through, and they want you to know what impact they say it had on the rest of his life. This is my brother, Kirk Andrew Murphy, right here. This is the one he was supposed to be. This is the last time Mark Murphy remembers his brother Kirk as a happy child. The photo was taken when Kirk was four, a year before he was placed in experimental therapy at UCLA to treat what doctors identified as exaggerated feminine behavior. It left Kirk just totally stricken with the belief that he was broken, that he was different from everybody else. Like Kirk's sister Maris and brother Mark say Kirk was never the same after therapy. The only thing they did was destroy our brother. I mean, they took him away from us. He was empty, nothing, nothing there. In 1970, Kirk Murphy was a smart, outgoing five-year-old growing up near Los Angeles. His mother, K.T. Murphy, however, was worried about him. Well, I was becoming a little concerned about playing with the girls' toys and stroking the hair, you know, the long hair and stuff. I was seeing effeminate mannerisms that bothered me because I wanted Kirk to grow up and have a normal life. Mrs. Murphy says she saw psychologists on a local TV program talking about behavior like Kirk's. He was naming all these things. If your son is doing five of these ten things, does he prefer to play with girls' toys instead of boys' toys? The psychologist was recruiting young boys for a government-funded program at UCLA, part of which was designed to reverse perceived feminine behavior, what one doctor involved with a program later called sissy boy syndrome. Him being the expert, I thought, well, maybe I should go ahead and take Kirk in. In other words, nip it in the bud. For nearly a year, Kirk was treated at UCLA, mainly by a man named George Reekers. Reekers was a doctoral student at the time, but went on to become a founding member of the Family Research Council, which lobbies against gay marriage, adoption, and laws that seek to protect the rights of gays and lesbians. Reekers has also been a prominent proponent of the belief homosexuality can be prevented. To treat Kirk's so-called sissy behavior, he was repeatedly placed in a room with two tables. He was observed through a one-way window. He was given toys to play with and could choose between traditionally masculine ones like plastic knives and guns or feminine toys like dolls and a play crib. He could also choose clothing to wear, an army hat and military fatigues, or a girl's dress, jewelry and a wig. Kirk's mother would be brought into the room and told to ignore him when he played with feminine toys or clothes and compliment him when he played with masculine ones. In a case study he wrote, George Reekers noted that when Kirk's mother ignored him, he would beg for attention from her, crying, even throwing tantrums. But Mrs. Murphy was told to continue to ignore him. And in this particular incident, they write that he becomes so upset, he's just beside himself, that they actually had to remove him from the room. And after they remove him from the room, they come in and tell my mom that it's working, and then they bring him back in and start all over. Having read th this, this report, I keep coming back to the word experimenting. Oh, absolutely. I mean, because it, do it, it doesn't seem like, this is yeah. not some proven treatment. This is, no. this is experimenting. The experimental therapy even continued outside UCLA. In Kirk's home, his parents were told to use poker chips as a system of reward and punishment to make Kirk act more masculine. Do you remember these chips? Yes, I do. Oh, yes, I do. Were you awarded them as well? You got, were you part of this? Yes, I was. My parents added me to it just so they could reinforce 
to my brother that, you know, Big Brother's doing it too, so everything's okay. These are the actual chips? Those yes, are the, actual the actual real chips. So blue chips were for masculine behavior? Yes. And the red chips were penalty yes. for feminine behavior? Yes. So if Kirk played with one of your dolls, he would get a red chip? Yes. According to George Reeker's case study, the red chips resulted in physical punishment by spanking from the father. Do you remember the beating? Oh, yes, sir, I do. Many times did I move the stacks around. How do you mean? I took some of the red chips and put them on my side. I, I, I did see the beatings, and it was just like, you know. You would take Kirk's red chips. Yes, sir. The things he had been given for feminine behavior, you yes. would take them yourself so yes. that he wouldn't get yes. beaten. We would come home from school, and it, it turned into that's the first thing that you did when you walked through the door. Is you looked, and what was the chip count today? What happened? What changed? How bad is it going to be? And it was always bad. The whipping every Friday night. I do remember one time he spanked him so hard that he had welts up and down his back and on his buttocks. And I remember Mark saying, cry harder and he won't hit so hard. Today it would be abuse. According to Kirk's brother and sister, his outgoing personality changed, and he began to behave in the way he knew his parents and George Reekers wanted him to. His family says the impact of the experimental therapy lasted his entire life. He had no idea how to relate to people. It's like somebody just walked up and turned his light switch off, and we got what we wanted, and we'll see you later. He actually ate his lunch in the boys' bathroom for three years, where he didn't have to put himself out there, even just to have a friend. In his case study of the UCLA experiment, George Reekers called Kirk Craig to protect his identity. He considered his work with Kirk a success, writing, Craig's feminine behavior was gone, and claiming Kirk became indistinguishable from any other boy. In numerous other published reports and studies over his nearly three-decade career since, George Reekers has continued to write positively about Kirk's treatment, using it as proof homosexuality can be prevented. Kirk's family has only recently discovered Reekers' writings, and they're outraged. They say Kirk was gay, but because of the treatment he was subjected to as a child, struggled with his attraction to men his whole life. He acknowledged himself as a gay man, 1985 on. He never had a committed loving relationship because he wouldn't allow himself to. Unable or unwilling to have a committed relationship with a man, Kirk focused on his work and chose a career where being openly gay wasn't even possible. He spent eight years in the U.S. Air Force and then held a high-profile position with an American finance company in India. Kirk, what do you think of your nephew? Keeping them honest every night, AC 360, CNN, weeknights 10 Eastern. Kirk, what do you think of your nephew? Yeah. Oh, we're on camera. Yeah. I'm just taking pictures. Kirk Murphy killed himself nearly six months after this video was taken in 2003. He was 38 years old and had struggled with being gay for most of his life struggle his family blames on experimental therapy that Kirk was subjected to as a five-year-old child. Experimental therapy that identified him as effeminate, a so-called sissy boy, and tried to fundamentally change his behavior. Kirk's mother enrolled him in the experimental therapy at UCLA in 1970 because of concerns he was playing with girls' toys. And I trusted these people because they were supposed to be the experts. But what they really told him was that the very core of who he was, was broken. I think my husband and I and Kirk were manipulated by this program. I think Kirk would have been better off if I hadn't taken him. Kirk's family had no idea George Reekers has, for the last three decades, used Kirk as an example of a child whose effeminate behavior was successfully altered. In numerous publications, Reekers has written about Kirk, calling him Craig to hide his identity. I blame them for the way his life turned out. If one person causes another person's death, I don't care if it's 20 or 50 years, it's the same as murder in my eyes. 
course, the actual reason someone commits suicide is difficult, if not impossible, to know. Kirk's family's allegations that George Reeker's therapy caused Kirk to take his own life are just that, allegations. I'm Richard from CNN. I'd like to talk to you about your uh, therapy that you did with Craig. George Reekers didn't respond to CNN's repeated request for an interview, so our producers tracked him down in Florida to ask him about the Murphy family's allegations. Would you just talk to us for a second about your therapy with the patient named Craig? It's published. We've interviewed Craig's family recently. They say that the therapy you did with him as a child led directly to his suicide as an adult. What do you say about that? I didn't know that. That's too bad. You're not aware of his suicide? No. What do you say to the family if they say that the therapy that you did with him as a child led to his suicide as an adult? Oh, well, I think scientifically that would be inaccurate uh, to assume that it was the therapy. But I do grieve for the parents now that you've told me that news. I think that's very sad. Reekers pointed out that his work with Kirk took place decades before his suicide. That's a long time ago. You have a hypothesis that a positive treatment back in the 1970s had something to do with something happening decades later, that, would, that hypothesis would need a lot of scientific investigation to see if it's valid. Uh, two independent psychologists of me uh, had evaluated him and said he was better adjusted after treatment, so it wasn't my opinion. One of those psychologists has since died. The other, Larry Ferguson, told us he did evaluate Kirk Murphy as a teenager. He told us the family was well adjusted and he didn't see any red flags when evaluating Kirk. But a psychiatrist who followed up with Kirk when he was 18, Dr. Richard Green, wrote that Kirk told him he would tried to kill himself the year before because he didn't, quote, want to grow up to be gay. Reekers insists the therapy was intended to help Kirk and his parents. Uh, I only meant to help. And the rationale was positive to help children, help the parents who come to us in their distress asking questions, what can we do to help our child be better adjusted? George Reekers has had a nearly three decade career as a champion of the anti-gay movement. In addition to being a founding member of the Family Research Council, he was also a board member of the National Association for Research and Therapy of Homosexuality, or NARTH, an organization whose members attempt to treat those who struggle with what they call unwanted homosexuality. Just last year, however, in a surprising twist, George Reeker's days as a prominent anti-gay activist abruptly ended. Reekers was caught with a young male escort he'd hired to accompany him on a trip to Europe. This photograph was taken of them in the airport in Miami. Reekers says he's not gay and denies any sexual contact with the escort. He says he hired him to help him carry his luggage. The escort says he gave Reekers sexual massages while in Europe. Reekers resigned from North after the scandal, and the Family Research Council said in a statement they haven't had contact with him in over a decade. Reeker's reputation among those who oppose homosexuality may be tarnished, but his research is still being cited. In this book, he co-authored Handbook of Therapy for Unwanted Homosexual Attractions. He continues to cite his work with Kirk, whom he calls Craig, as a success. He writes that the case was, quote, the first experimentally demonstrated reversal of a cross-gender identity with psychological treatment. The book was published in 2009, six years after Kirk Murphy took his own life. The research um, has a postscript to it that needs to be added and that is to acknowledge that Kirk Andrew Murphy was Craig and he was gay and he committed suicide. What do you want people to, to, to remember about Kirk, to know about Kirk? That this was a little boy who deserved protection, respect, and unconditional love. And I don't want him to be remembered as a science experiment. He was a person. Keeping them honest every night, AC 360, CNN, weeknights 10 Eastern. For the last two nights, we've uh, been airing a part, a, uh, an investigation um, called the Sissy Boy Experiment, Uncovering the Truth. Um, it now moves to the present, tonight in part three. Over the last two nights, 
We've shown you what happened more than three decades ago to a little boy named Kirk Andrew Murphy, who got enrolled in a government-funded study aimed at making effeminate boys more masculine. He was just five years old. It was the early 1970s, and his treatment was called a success by the man who ran the study. But Kirk's siblings told us their brother was deeply damaged by the experimental treatment he received and struggled with being gay all his life. When he was 38 years old, Kirk Murphy hung himself. The research that was done on Kirk lives on, however. It's still being cited by those who think they can prevent kids from becoming gay. And some kids, like Kirk, whose parents don't want them to be gay, are being sent to something called reparative therapy. Ryan Kendall is a man who was sent to reparative therapy when he was a teenager. Here's Randy Kays with part three of our investigation. Growing up, Ryan Kendall had a secret, a secret he'd shared in the pages of his diary. But when Ryan was just 13, his mother read his diary and discovered Ryan was gay. It was the beginning of the most painful years of his life. I didn't question the world I had grown up in. I thought there was some legitimacy to this idea that I was an evil sinner who was going to burn in hell. And for years, I thought that God hated me because I was gay. Ryan says his parents were determined to change their son. As Ryan tells it, his parents signed him up for what's called reparative therapy with the National Association for Research and Therapy of Homosexuality, otherwise known as NARTH. Every day I would hear, this is a choice. This can be fixed. And, and did I, you believe that? I never believed that. I know I'm gay just like I know I'm short and I'm half Hispanic. And I've never thought that those facts would change. It's part of my core fundamental identity. So the parallel would be sending me to tall camp and saying, if you try really hard, one day you can be six foot one. Ryan says he was treated by Joseph Nicolosi, a clinical psychologist who today is still associated with NARTH. The constant refrain was the religious one, that this is an abomination, that this is a sickness that can be fixed, that you don't want to be an effeminate man so you want to butch up, that this is something that makes God cry, that this is something your family doesn't want for you. At his office outside Los Angeles, we asked Nicolosi if he remembered treating Ryan Kendall about 14 years ago. I'm not familiar with the name at all. His parents have provided bills yes. from your office. Yes. There have been yes. checks written yes. Yes. to your office, but yes. no record. No. He says that, that your therapy was quite harmful. He said that he was told 1% of the world is gay. It's 2%. He said that you told him to butch up quote, unquote. Never. That's um, not our language. And that when he was sobbing, he was told that it was wrong Absolutely to be homosexual. Not. Absolutely. We do not do that kind of work. When the client begins the session, how can I help you? What do you want to work on today? I have to be seen as an ally, a helper, a good father figure, a good male image. This is what's curative. I have to be the man who accepts you for who you are. When somebody says people like yourself, others are trying to get the gay out of people. That's a terrible way of phrasing it. I would rather say we are trying to bring out the heterosexuality in you. It's still a struggle. At 14, Ryan says he had no interest in changing or continuing therapy with Nicolosi. Did Nicolosi understand that you were there against your will? Absolutely. Nicolosi knew that I wasn't a willing participant, but this is what he does. He takes in gay kids whose families want them to be straight, and he goes to work on them. Nicolosi told us that's not true. And you put the child's interest before the parents, even. Absolutely. Absolutely. He says he's kept hundreds of children from growing up to be gay. One of the researchers he points to is this man, George Reekers a big believer that homosexuality can be prevented. Nicolosi even cites Reeker's work in his book, A Parent's Guide to Preventing Homosexuality. He uses Reeker's therapy with a feminine boy as evidence that therapy can keep children from growing up to be gay. He writes that growth into a heterosexual identity is indeed possible. George Reeker's has done pioneering work in this for many, many years. What Nicolosi didn't know until our interview was that the young boy he cites as a success story, whose real name is Kirk Murphy, struggled with being gay his entire life. He committed suicide in 2003 when he was 38 years old.
Kirk's family says the torment brought on by the therapy is why Kirk took his own life. But Reekers argues there's no way to prove his therapy had anything to do with Kirk's suicide decades later. George Reekers has done a lot of research. He's done a lifetime of research. If there is somebody who committed suicide, that's tragic. But we have to look at the body of literature. That's what we're relying on. Nicolosi claims science supports the idea that people are not born gay. We say that homosexuality is an adaptation to an emotional breach with the parents, primarily parents of the same sex. So for the boy, it's an emotional breach, a failure to bond with the father. Dr. Joseph Nicolosi simply makes things up when it comes to science. Wayne Besson is an advocate for gay equality with the organization Truth Wins Out. He says a person who is a gay man is a distant father and isn't good at sports. I, for example, was an all-city basketball player in high school and I'm incredibly close to my father. The American Psychiatric Association opposes reparative therapy. The group's position statement says the potential risks are great, including depression, anxiety, and self-destructive behavior. Nicolosi says his therapy isn't harmful, and he only treats people who want to change. Does it concern you that there may be a psychological impact on some of these kids? Well, I mean, there's much more push from society to be not homosexual, not to be gay, that's for sure. You're saying they feel more pressure out there than in here? Absolutely. Every day I deal with people who have been harmed, who were survivors of these groups that try to say they can pray away the gay and change people from gay to straight. And I can tell you, it's, it's incredibly destructive, it harms people at a very deep level. Ryan is now back in school. He says the only way he was able to escape therapy with Nicolosi was by surrendering himself to the Department of Human Services in Colorado Springs and legally separating from his family. But he'd been through more than a year of therapy by then and had already slipped into a deep depression and thoughts of suicide. What they did hurt me. It tore apart my family. It led me to periods of homelessness, to drug abuse, to spending a decade of my life wanting to kill myself. It led to so much pain and struggle, and I want them to know that what they do hurts people, it hurts children, it has no basis in fact, and they need to stop. This is unfair to have these accusations put to me like this. I'm not familiar with the case. All I can do is speak in generalities, and we would never do that to any client. What happened to me is not something that goes away. I don't get that decade of my life back. I don't get those opportunities back. And I don't get my family back. And I will live with the damage that these individuals did for the rest of my life. Now 28, Ryan has plans to become a lawyer one day, to advocate for children because, he says, no one was there to stand up for him. Randy Kay, CNN, Los Angeles.